where does Hideo Kashima get his ideas? In this podcast, we take a deep dive into his brain and shed light on his creative process. Hideo Kashima presents Brain Structure. こんにちは。小島秀夫です。Hello, I'm Hideo Kojima. 今日からスタートしましたポッドキャストプログラム。Hideo Kojima presents Brain Structure. This will be our first episode of Hideo Kojima presents Brain Structure. Well, I've been hosting radio shows and my own podcasts, but this show will be delivered to the world simultaneously for the first time, and I'm very excited. どうなることやと思いますけど、まあ。Well, we don't know what will happen, but we'll listen to the voices and we'll polish it as we go along. And now I would like to introduce my partner who will join me to navigate this show. Nice to meet you. You can call me Brains. I will do my best as your partner for the show. Starting today, we're going to stream to the world. Mr. Kojima, please allow me to explain what this podcast is all about. Hideo Kojima presents Brain Structure. Is a podcast in which we dive into the brain of Hideo Kojima, creator of international hit video games such as the Metal Gear series and Death Stranding. On this show, you will not only learn about how he creates his games, but also about what has inspired his ideas from movies to music, books, art, philosophy, and even current events. We will discuss a variety of themes in each episode, which will air in 183 countries and regions worldwide. And, since this is an international podcast, there will be an English version and a Japanese version of the show, featuring translations for both. I think this is a question everyone wants to hear the answer to. Why did you decide to start a podcast now? Well, I grew up listening to radio, especially late night radio programs. We still have radio today, but recently it's podcast, right? Everyone has at least one device that could listen to podcast on demand. I used to have a radio program in Japan, but my fans are all over the world, and those who live overseas couldn't understand Japanese or cannot receive radio waves from Japan. I've been receiving many comments from overseas and been giving thoughts about that problem and thought podcast will solve that problem. Another problem, which is the language, but it could be translated and overdub English onto my Japanese. It won't be my actual voice, but it will still deliver my thoughts and message. So I've talked with people from Spotify and we agreed to work together and decided to do this show. I think this is the type of podcast everyone has been waiting for. Without further ado, let's get started. Hideo Kojima presents Brain Structure. The theme of episode one is Dive into the Brain of Hideo Kojima. In this first episode, we will dive deep into Mr. Kojima's brain. Let's begin with a few questions to get a closer look into how he thinks. Okay, well, let's do it. So, let us begin with some questions from Mr. Kojima. The first question is How did you come up with the idea for Metal Gear Solid? Well, I've been telling this story many times, but it was probably about 35 years ago when I created Metal Gear. Shooting games or shooters is still popular today, but battle happens when you and the enemy appears. The enemy dies when you shoot or when you are shot by the enemy, you die. That was the basic rule of a game. My parents experienced the war, and what I didn't like in the shooters or battle games was that there was no background why A and B were fighting. You don't know why you're fighting, you just know that you're strong. That doesn't happen in the real world. There's always reason for fighting. When nation A and B are at war, there's always a reason. That reason was not explained at all at that time, so I wanted to depict it. I think there are different ways to fight battles. 
Instead of war, you can choose to fight by running from the battlefield. I wanted to create that kind of game, but it's difficult to make that heroic. If you're just running away, the players will have a hard time emphasizing with the character, right? So when I was trying to figure out how to make that work, the player is in a sense running away, but you must first infiltrate an enemy base without any weapons, collect any weaponry on the spot, and clear the mission before escaping. By changing the perspective a little bit, a heroic element is born. So that's where stealth came from and how Metal Gear came to life. Another thing is that these days the spec of the game machine is very high and the quality is close to movies, but when I started my career in the game industry, when a player shoots about four bullets, they will disappear from the screen. Objects, or it was called sprites, the screen was very limited, and when that limit is exceeded, they will disappear. So if there's a player with three other enemies on the screen, and when they start shooting at once, everything will disappear. Back then, the game machine we worked on was called MSX, and it could not portray battles. So we had to make something that could feel like a combat game without shooting so many bullets. We proposed a rule that the character hides from the enemies that attack the character. We proposed a rule that the character hides from the enemies that attacks. If the character gets shot, he dies, and game over. So one reason was my wish, and the other was the limit of the hardware at that time. As a result, it was not intentional, but that's how Metal Gear was born. When you first shared this idea with those around you, what was their reaction? It happens every time, but no one supported my ideas. The game that escapes from the enemy, player doesn't have any weapon to begin with, and it gets ganged up. Plus, it was the time when games did not require any story at all. I had a hard time making it. You probably needed to work to convince those around you, especially the team that was going to develop the game. How did you go about convincing them? I just joined the game industry as a newbie. My previous project was a mess, so no one trusted me. There was an atmosphere that something bad will happen when they join my project, so it was difficult to find someone who would help me. As I approached in different ways and talked them into joining in, still, and as we moved on, it was difficult because no one has seen it. No matter what I said or drew pictures to describe what was happening, nobody got the idea. Staff members who were making the game were saying that it was impossible and it would fail. But once the player started moving, at that time we didn't have AI, so it was like something will appear in the field of view and the program will change to chase the player and shoots at the player. Then everyone got the idea. When the player is found by the enemy and an exclamation mark appears on the screen, that is the moment when stillness turns into motion. At that time, most of the game was either always still or always in motion, didn't really have any contrast. When I experienced that contrast, I was certain that this could work and I could sense that my team has shifted their minds too. You realized this during development? That's right. Metal Gear has said that it created a genre called stealth, but there's also Boktai or Lunar Night, which were created for the Game Boy Advance. It featured sunlight sensor on the ROM. Once that sensor catches the sunlight, UV light actually, you can attack vampires depending on the amount of UV light it captures. If you play that game indoors, there's no sun, right? If you play during the night, there will be no sun as well. You need sunlight to defeat the vampires, so it needs to be played during the daytime, under the sun, or outside. When I tried to make this game, everyone was against the idea. Everyone got the idea when it was developed further. Same goes for Death Stranding. They said delivery game is not a game. 
Open world has fast travel, and it's a bit weird. You can go beyond the horizon in the open world, but there are not many games that use that advantage. To enjoy the traveling process is what Death Stranding is, but nobody agreed. Some said if Kojima is saying so, it's worth a shot, but very few understood the concept. Everyone got the idea after it was developed to a certain level, and it was fast after that. What do you think was the primary reason that Metal Gear became a worldwide hit? Honestly, I don't know. It was Metal Gear, then Metal Gear Solid. But Metal Gear was only sold in Japan and was made for the MSX. Metal Gear Solid was made for the PlayStation, and like this podcast, it was distributed worldwide. The game was a huge hit, but I didn't intend to sell it at that level. I was just making something I enjoyed. I was making a story in a world I liked with tone that other games didn't have. I think the key was that it was sold worldwide instead of just locally in Japan, and that was big. When I was talking to the fans of Metal Gear Solid, I found out that stealth was not a popular genre initially. It was cumbersome, nerve-wracking, and made people queasy. But it was the story in the game that resonated with the people. The characters in the game had a solid background. That is common for movies, but in games, there are enemies that simply appear then die. As for Metal Gear Solid, I give a proper background and character to even the boss enemy. I think that was part of the reason why it got high ratings. Today, it is said that I created a genre called a stealth game, but it took five to ten years to gain that reputation. After Metal Gear Solid 1, 2, 3, other companies and studios started to develop stealth games, and that's when the genre got acknowledged. I think something the listeners would be very interested in hearing about would be Snake. How did you come up with the character? The snake. Actually, his name is Solid Snake. So Snake was taken from Snake Plissken. When you sneak into enemy territory, you need to be light. Snakes don't make a sound, and foxes also don't leave footprints on the grass like other animals. So foxes and snakes don't leave any traces, and that was the image, or like an icon, was a snake. And I'm also a fan of Snake Plissken, so I wanted the code name to be Snake or Cobra or Python. It could have been anything but plain Snake, because I thought that would have been boring. Snakes have an image of being wiggly, and to that I added solid, which has the image of being hard. For me, it comes from Solid State Survivors, a song by YMO. Snake having a soft and wiggly image, and solid being the opposite. I wanted to put those two contradicting words together to create contrast, and that's how Solid Snake was born. I made the first two for the MSX, but the character was so small, it didn't have a face, it was just pixels. It was multi-layer animation, no actions, just patterns. The camera doesn't zoom in, so it doesn't have things like cutscenes like it does today. At that point, it has zero character. The player was yourself. He had the name Snake, but I didn't draw out much background. The PlayStation version of Metal Gear Solid allowed Snake to talk, cameras to move, and the use of cutscenes. That was how more characters could be added. So David Hayter played the English version and Akio Otsuka played the Japanese version. But at that time, the characters could talk because it was on a CD-ROM. It was a bit like James Bond trying to score woman, and he talked a lot. The original Snake didn't speak much. He just stood there smoking like an old hard-boiled character. That was because it wasn't a CD-ROM. They couldn't talk, like a Chaplin film. 
But when CD-ROMs became a thing, we felt like the characters had to talk, so they speak a lot. And that's how we gained reputation. But the original Snake fans in Japan, who were used to playing the MSX version, were like, Snake isn't a womanizer, or Snake doesn't talk that cheerfully. Now people don't say that kind of stuff, but there was a quite bit of backlash at that time. The character of Snake has changed little by little with the times and the evolution of the hardware. PlayStation seems to have had a big influence then. Yeah, it was huge. Was MSX an extremely high-end system at the time too? <laughs> Nintendo Entertainment System was little better, action-wise. Arcade games were the reason why I wanted to get into the game industry. I wanted to make either arcade games or games for Nintendo. Those were made for action and shooting. The MSX was basically a computer, and you could only do simple shooting, so it wasn't really made for action games. It had limits on the numbers of objects that could appear on the screen, so we needed to elaborate the setting, plot, and story. If I had worked for a department that made games for Nintendo or arcades, I probably wouldn't have made games like Metal Gear. Did you come up with this idea because of those particular characteristics? We didn't have the advantage of the visuals and action, so how could we make up for that? The old PC-88 games were like that. Action was a weak point, so adventure games and simulation games, you could call them RPGs, were born because of that PC. So those limitations actually inspired your ingenuity? Like I said earlier, Metal Gear was born because we couldn't make action games using combat. So I came up with the idea of stealth. And with that, I decided to use text and plot to depict the world of espionage. That was the only way. But it didn't happen instantly. I was 23, 24 when I started my career. But if I were to begin my career now in 2022, I probably wouldn't make Metal Gear. Because it's possible to do so many more things now? Now that we have more options and there are more things we can do, you gotta decide which direction you wanna go in. You can't do everything, right? First there was the MSX, then the PC Engine, after that CD-ROMs came out and characters started talking, then movies were added. Although it was compressed, the PlayStation and Sega Saturn introduced 3D. Then, that started to move in real time. All of these happened step by step. It didn't come about suddenly, because it happened over a period of time. I was able to create the game that exists now. And there we have it. For our first episode, we were really able to gain some valuable insight. I think it's thanks to this podcast format that we were able to go so deep. That will be all for my questions. I hope our listeners were able to dive deep into Mr. Kojima's brain with us. Let's move on to the next segment. Hideo Kojima presents Brain Stretcher. Here is Jeff Keighley's one-man show, TGA, The Jeff's Answer. A little introduction of Jeff Keighley. Jeff is a gaming journalist and TV host from Canada. He is the organizer of The Game Awards, the world's biggest award show for video games. He also produces the Summer Game Fest and GameCon's opening night live show. In each episode, Jeff will deliver a variety of fresh entertainment news. What is the relationship between Jeff and you, Mr. Kojima? Jeff and I go back a long way. He is like my comrade. I don't really remember the beginning, but when Metal Gear Solid 2 hit the market in 2001, and just before that busy time, Jeff was in his 20s, fresh out of college. Wanted to come to Japan and join our team to film a documentary. That was a bit annoying at first. We've known each other since then, and now he's become the face of the game industry who's known worldwide. He organizes the Game Awards, and everyone knows him. He's well known in the film industry and has many connections with the game studios, management, promoters, musicians. For example, say you want to meet someone but you don't have their email address, right? 
で普通いろいろ聞きますよねいろんな関係者に。So typically you'd ask around many people, but if you ask Jeff, he'll most definitely knows. Not only he's well known, but he's also well trusted. I don't give my email address to many people, but Jeff has everyone's address. That shows how trusted he is. I don't want to compliment him too much because he's like on our team, but he's a great person. And now, here is Jeff Keeley. TGA, the Jeff's answer. Hi, everyone. It's Jeff Keeley from the Game Awards. Get it? TGA. And this week, I'm coming to you from Cologne, Germany, where I just wrapped up Gamescom Opening Night Live and announced this podcast on stage. Hideo kindly asked me if I'd be able to contribute a short segment to his show that highlights what's going on in the world of gaming and entertainment. And of course, I was honored to be asked. So this time, I'm going to recap some of the big gaming news from Opening Night Live. First, PlayStation announced the DualSense Edge wireless controller for PS5. Well, we don't know a date or price, this is a highly customizable controller similar to the Xbox Elite that is all about tweaking your performance. You can fine tune your aim by adjusting the stick sensitivity and even swap out the analog pads and save different controller profiles that you can move between with a button on the controller. And of course, it still features the haptic feedback of the regular DualSense. The most surprising announcement of ONL was probably Killer Clowns from Outer Space, a video game based on the cult classic 1980s sci fi horror film, where aliens dressed as rubber clown puppets come to Earth in a circus tent shaped spaceship and invade a small town. This is going to be a 3v7 online game where you play as the clowns or humans and battle against each other in an asymmetrical multiplayer experience. One of my most anticipated games is the Callisto Protocol from Glenn Schofield and Striking Distance Studios. Glenn created the Dead Space franchise and is now building this new sci fi horror game set on Jupiter's moon of Callisto. Starring Josh Dumel as a prisoner, aliens invade the prison, and we showed off some great footage of mutations, which is what happens when you. Try to strategically dismember one of these aliens, but don't quite do it in time. They start to multiply and mutate, which makes the game even harder.、Uh, the gunplay, the gameplay, the story, everything looks incredible about this. It feels very next gen, and the game is going to come out this December. And finally, one of last year's best movies, at least in my opinion, Dune, is getting an MMO, a massively multiplayer game from Funcom, creators of Conan. A CGI trailer for the game was shown during Opening Night Live, and there's not a lot we can glean from this, but based on what they've released since then, we know you're going to have to survive in Arrakis shared by thousands of players. You've got to control that spice and fight for that spice. I love the look and feel of the movie, and I'm very curious how Denny Villeneuve's vision is going to translate into a massively multiplayer online game. That's it for this time. I'm Jeff Keeley, and now back. To Mr. Kojima. Thanks, Jeff. I'll be looking forward to his report from the scene. He knows the latest news even more than us game developers. He knows everything, but won't tell me even when I ask him. But hopefully, we can learn more about what's going on through these reports. Jeff Keighley's report, TGA, the Jeff's answer. Jeff Keighley's report, TGA, the Jeff's answer. TGA, the Jeff's answer. でしたさてです、ね、早くも第1回のエンディングのお時間です。Well, that's a wrap on our first episode. Time just flew by. It was our first one, so we'll continue to make the show more interesting as we go. With messages, opinions, and requests from our listeners. Stay tuned for the next episode of Hideo Kojima Presents Brain Structure. We'll be back next week. Until then, see ya. So, t h e r e are a lot of people. Hideo Kojima Presents Brain Structure is a production by Spotify Studios. In association with Kojima Productions and Fam Inc. TGA, the Jeff's Answer MC, Jeff Keeley. MC, Translator, Shinsuke Ochiai. Narrator, Owen Maki and Kayleen. Music, 
Silent Poets. Visual Design, Mechikuro. Producer, Hiro Furuki. Director, Kohei Takizawa. Executive Producer at Spotify, Asami Sekine. Special thanks to Kojima Productions, Ayako Terashima, Masafumi Chiba, and Aki Saito. Hosted by Hideo Kojima. Still there? Stay tuned for the next episode where Hideo talks more about Nope Movie. Nope. <laughs>